Okay, so thank you so much uh, to everybody for being here today. Uh, we're going to go through some introductions momentarily, uh, let you know about who your presenters will be today. And then we will also be um, going through ultimately our substantive presentation on the topic you see here on the screen, which is successful negotiation and implementation of bulk telecommunications agreements in community associations. It's a mouthful, that's for sure, but the reality is that it is an incredibly important topic worthy of every one of those words. Um, and the agenda here shows about the big picture story we're going to be telling to you today. Now, in telling that big picture story, we, one thing you're going to hear loud and clear from us today is that this is truly an exceptional, once in a, I'll call it generation opportunity for your community association. It's not quite once a generation, but usually it's once every five to ten years. You might get this incredible opportunity to really do something special for your community, uh, to improve telecommunication services and sometimes drive down price and even generate revenue for your association all at the same time. Um, it's, it, the, the, the agenda on your screen covers the big topics that we will be breaking out into very, very helpful detail, I believe. And so we'll be going through, first and foremost, what are bulk telecom services and what are our bulk telecommunications agreements? Um, because, you know, bulk telecom, as you'll learn, it can include things like cable, television service, also can include things like internet service and beyond. What are the benefits of bulk service? Well, I sort of teased it a little bit. Um, I'll let Michael Cameron really drive it home for you because like I'm about to share with you, Michael is uniquely qualified to talk about these types of transactions and as a team, we're pretty powerful. Um, but you can get a lot, a lot of bang for your buck when it comes to economies of scale. Uh, these bulk telecommunications companies place incredible value on securing long-term contracts for all the residents in your communities having their telecom service through that provider. So you can use your bargaining power as a community to really, really leverage your, your position with these telecom providers and deliver something special for your owners. Um, now, in pursuing this type of transaction, there are some unique provisions of Florida's Condominium Act and Homeowners Association Acts, which both deal with some of the special compliance considerations associated with bulk telecommunications agreements. This is when I get my time to shine. This, this presentation is mostly about Michael Cameron from the legal side, and, and Leslie is a wealth of knowledge on, on the management and consulting side. Um, but the statutory analysis is where I'll, I'll, I'll peek, uh, you know, rear my head a little bit more in this presentation um, and help you understand about the special compliance considerations you need to be aware of if you decide to pursue a transaction like this. Um, and then ultimately, once you comply with those, uh, those regulatory considerations under 718 and 720, the Condo and HOA Acts, then you will be able to, just, to proceed to the next step, which is how do you implement the bulk telecom agreement for your community association? Uh, it's a very involved process, but the team of talent you see on your screen here today are the right people to help give you advice on this. Um, while I cannot, while I want to disclaim up front that today's presentation is not to be construed as legal advice and is for informational purposes. Sorry if I sound like a Cialis commercial there. Uh, the reality is, though, <laughs> that we do want to say that up front because every single community association that pursues a transaction like this needs to go in eyes wide open and get savvy legal advice that's particular to their community. So this is a webinar. Hopefully it'll get you started on informational level. But if you decide to proceed with a transaction like this, please, please, please consult with your association's legal counsel. That can be uh, your general counsel. If you need help, you certainly are welcome to call our firm anytime as well. Um, one thing we will uh, make clear is that um, we always are happy to be special counsel in these types of situations. Not all community association general counsels like us um, have that specialty, or, or, or I, should, I should say um, have that special experience with bulk telecom agreements. Um, so we are always happy to work with our friends in the legal community if you have a long-term general counsel. But bottom line, if you decide to pursue this, make sure you consult with legal counsel, whomever that might be. Now, one option for your legal counsel is right here on the screen. He, he looks a little bit younger than he does today uh, based on the fact that he's got a six-year-old and eight-year-old daughter um, and uh, a puppy at home that his daughter's got over the weekend that is keeping him up a lot at night. So I'm speaking in the third person a lot, but this is my, me right here on the screen. I'm Michael Kassauer, one of the partners here at Frank Weinberg & Black. Been with the firm for well over a decade at this point. Really proud to have been here for a long time with Michael Cameron, who's also been at the firm for even longer than I have, uh, probably going on 15, 20 years, I would speculate, although Michael will speak for himself. Myself, I am a double gator, University of Florida, um, and I'm a board certified attorney in condominium and plan development law. There's a couple hundred of us in the state of Florida. We have a couple of them at the firm, very proud of that. 
And I told you I'm a girl dad, um, so you know that about me already. I, I, I've got the, the wrinkles and the receding hairline to show for it, but I love them. And, uh, and I, you know, this is, this is home for me, born and raised here in South Florida, um, have always lived in South Florida, with the exception of the, the seven years I spent up in Gainesville. Um, love it here and love servicing community associations throughout the state. Um, my law partner who I'm presenting with today, Michael Kammer, uh, he, he spent even more time at the University of Florida than me, and not because uh, he, he um, was, was put on probation or anything uh, funny, any funny business like that, but he's got even more degrees than I do. Uh, Michael Kammer has a bachelor's degree in finance and a JD from the University of Florida for his law degree, uh, just like I do, but he kept going, and he has an LLM in tax law as well, which uh, is something that is pretty special for these types of transactions as well, because it just sort of shows that we're a very business-minded firm, and Michael really brings the business savvy to these types of transactions um, to make sure you really have your basis covered and, and get good legal terms for your community association. Um, now, to tell you a bit about the firm, uh, like I said, the name of the firm is Frank Weinberg & Black. We are a full-service firm and have been in operation for nearly 40 years. We have three offices throughout the state of Florida, Broward County, uh, Palm Beach County, and Volusia Counties. Uh, so we, we service community associations throughout the state of Florida. I always brag in these presentations, and people think I'm silly for doing it, that we are not a pure condo HOA firm. We have about eight attorneys who the dominant share of their practice is community association work. But then we have you know another 15 or so attorneys who service our community association clients in a very special way, in my opinion. And that special way is that when you have an employment issue for your community association, you get an employment attorney that understands condo issues not a condo attorney that's dabbling in employment issues. When you have a construction contract, you might get Harry in our BOCA office who has incredible experience with you know, hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars in construction contracts. So what we actually have is a business firm, and that at the end of the day is what a community association is, is you are a not-for-profit business, uh, then so for that reason, we have the team of talent to service collections, construction contracts, construction litigation, employment issues, housing discrimination uh, claims compliance issues under 718, 720, et cetera. So that's the firm. Um, I'm also super excited for this presentation to, to not have it just be about FWB, but I'm particularly excited today because while Michael and I have had the pleasure of doing this presentation together before, today we're presenting with Leslie Alvarez. And, and I'll hand it over to Leslie in a moment to introduce herself, but I, I, I'm super excited about this because I've had the pleasure of knowing Leslie for a lot of years now. Uh, you know, she, she's, uh, she's seen me since I was a, a younger buck at FWB, and, and we both had the opportunity to work together in the profession at, at, pri at, you know, through our shared clients in the past. And Leslie now, she's a, a tour de force, for those of you that don't know her. Um, she's a wealth of knowledge. And, I'm, I, you know, Leslie, if I'm, if I'm speaking accurately here, you recently started a shop uh, to provide management services and consulting services. And I think it's an incredible thing because, uh, you know, Leslie's really got – a unique background and is one of the hardest workers I've ever seen in, in the management industry. So, Leslie, with that with that low bar of an introduction uh, that I hopefully I didn't set it too high for you, but uh, would you like to introduce yourself a little bit? Thanks, Michael. I appreciate that. So, I am um, uh, Leslie Alvarez, as Michael said. I am a 26-year veteran in the industry. I've been managing across the U.S., uh, largely in Texas, but also in Atlanta, and then I've been here in South Florida now for the past six years. I started working with some self-managed associations and providing consulting services to them. And then I've just grown it into, as Michael said, um, recently I've launched um, full service management services as well. But I actually am very involved also in um, Community Associations Institute, CAI, for those of you that don't know, is kind of, you know, Michael and Michael know about the state bar and they're involved in that and they take care of, you know, the education and lobbying and things that they need for their industry. And CAI does that for our industry, for community associations. They represent both managers in the, in the, in the industry and provide education board members, and also um, business partners. So I'm very involved in CAI. I sit on the local chapter for CAI Gold Coast Board of Directors, and I also sit on the International Managers um, Representation Group for the international organization. I'm a CE provider for um, the DBPR and provide educational programming um, on demand often. And um, just I'm really excited to be here because, you know, Michael and Michael are two of the um, shining stars out there. And um, yeah, Mike at Cassauer used to have a lot more hair. Um, <laughs> 
But I will say um, I'm not a girl mom. I'm a girl and boy mom. So I've got the best of both worlds, um, but mine are now adults. So um, I've got the gray hair um, from that um, living through the teen years, guys. So good luck. <laughs> I don't see any gray hair in that picture, Leslie. I don't know what you're talking I have about. A ver- I have a very good hairstylist. <laughs> yeah. uh, that, thank you for that, Leslie. So uh, if, if I'm not interrupting you, I can hand it no, over to my camera ahead. momentarily. One thing I just want to do to really, and again, I, I, I have a bad habit of just being so excited about the people I'm presenting with that I, I puff them up so much that I set the bar super high for them. But Leslie's incredible. And Michael's also incredible. And, and so before Michael now takes over on the next slide with um, with our, our first topic of the agenda, I just want to add, because Michael's too humble to brag about himself, What Michael Michael is truly a special attorney when it comes to this area of representation. Um, and, and I don't want to just make it puffery. I want to explain to you why. Um, so Michael and I have been at the firm for a long time. Michael worked for a long time and still does with our firm's active founding principal partner, Steve Weinberg. Um, who has worked with community associations as well since the firm's inception. Because of Michael's background as a transactional corporate attorney and his financial acumen as well, I think he became heavily involved at an early stage in our bulk telecommunications agreements for our community association clients. Why do I mention that background? Well, there's a lot of attorneys that have the wherewithal to probably read a bulk telecom agreement and look out for the standard types of legal provisions, indemnities, attorney's fees, forms, the stuff you see all the time. Uh, what makes Michael uniquely qualified, though, is he spent so many years working alongside not only great attorneys at our firm, but also the telecommunications consultants in the industry, that he ended up forming relationships with a lot of the different providers, which they're, they're, we don't represent any of these providers. We, are, we remain neutral at all times, but we're proud to say that we have good relationships with, the, with some of the higher level people at these, uh, these telecommunications companies and have an understanding of, of generally what some of the industry standards are, even though every transaction is certainly different. Um, and so ultimately, Michael has a really good sense of the, the business uh, dynamics of these transactions, really good sense of the legal provisions when it comes to the services, and also the wherewithal to anticipate the construction aspects of these agreements, because that is ultimately what they become eventually is a construction agreement if you have to build out new infrastructure. Um, so with that said, Michael, I set the bar really high, but I know you'll deliver like you do every time. If you'd like to take over and uh, take our first topic of what are bulk telecommunication services and what are bulk telecom agreements, uh, I'm sure the people at home will appreciate it. Absolutely. Uh, thank you uh, for the, for those kind words uh, from both of you, and uh, welcome everyone to to our webinar. Um, today we're, we're going to talk about a very interesting topic that seems to be um, just a, a topic of, of highly high interest out there just because of the significant changes in technology out there and uh, our, our continued use and, and need for, for, for better services. So the first topic we're going to talk about are what are bulk telecommunication services and what are bulk telecom agreements from a general sense. So first, it's an agreement between a service provider and an association. And one of the most important aspects of it um, in comparison to a retail relationship, which is you know a one-off relationship, this is an agreement that is going to govern all units in an association, whether it be a condominium or an HOA. These agreements typically um, are, are provide bulk uh, video on, on a, a bulk, bulk basis. And in, in more recent years, it is now included internet. So, so when I first started doing these agreements many years ago, we're, we're talking going into my 20th year at the firm, um, you know, th- it was pretty much just video. But with the, with the advances in technologies and uh, the need for, for internet services, it has become more and more common to have both. And that's called a double play in the industry. Um, but but it does, it's not just limited to video and internet. Um, commonly, you can include telephone, you can include home security, home automation services, and, and as additional services get offered by these providers, um, they'll they'll continue to offer additional services in a bulk setting. But topic number two, um, and I think this is really where it drives home why this is such a, a hot topic. What are the benefits of a bulk telecommunication services? Um, pretty clear number one goal or number one reason that there's a benefit. It is money. It, it's that simple. Um, these agreements um, provide a long-term commitment to a provider 
but in exchange you get you an association and, and the residents receive up to a 50 to 70 percent discount when compared to retail um so that's huge um a lot of these agreements you know let's say five six years ago were or video only as i just mentioned however you'd have 80 to 90 percent of the residents paying for internet on a retail basis so it really created an opportunity for for, for associations to add to these agreements and to save a significant sum of money. Now, another thing besides saving money at the individual level, uh, there's some benefits to the associations themselves. Um, the number one benefit you, that I typically see is what's called a door fee. It's nothing more than a signing bonus. And so this is based and usually calculated based on the number of units. And they, that's why they call it a door fee, the number of doors. And so this money can be used for a whole host of reasons. It can be used for capital improvement projects. You want to remodel, you want to pave the roads, whatever it may be. But importantly, especially in light of the economic climate we're all experiencing, everything's going up in cost. So oftentimes this door fee can be a nice cash infusion to offset some of those increases in operational costs. Now, another thing that, that can be provided in lieu of a door fee, um, and is something that I, I commonly recommend to my clients, um, unless there's a special need for the cash, is to take that same amount, that door fee, whether it be $100,000, let's just use that because it's a simple number, is to take it as free services. So, so how do you do that? You, a provider, you sign the agreement, and instead of paying a bill for the first six months, whatever that, however long it takes to burn down the 100000 now an association will receive the whole hundred thousand dollars without the tax consequences. So if, if you're using that example of a hundred grand, you may be giving up 30,000 to uncle Sam taking it as free services. You could still have the same benefit. And there's, there's ways to still get that money into your association's bank account. So you could still use it for some of those things like capital improvement projects. And so I think, uh, you know, being able to negotiate, the door fee, as far as services, really maximizes the benefit that, that an association can enjoy. Going on with what are the benefits of a, a bulk telecommunications agreement is you have to understand that these agreements um, provide for the installation of a um, telecommunications network. And these networks are very expensive. Um, typically, a fiber installation can cost upwards of $1,000 per unit or more. So by signing one of these agreements, you're going to induce one of these providers to make a significant capital investment in your community. Without having that long-term commitment, it is very difficult to get any provider to come into your community. And so what this does is now provides um, access to to other services with other with other providers, and uh, you know these these are great great trade off in value as far as these agreements and the providers and the the benefits that the associations receive as well. <clears throat> so, a new telecommunications network is typically two kinds. You have your hybrid network, which is your your older systems. It's partially fiber. Um, you see this a lot with Comcast where they have fiber to the node and then brings it into your community and distributes to each unit through a copper coax based. Um, Com Comcast does offer a fiber full system as well, but this is your, what you see um, as, as the older base systems, the legacy systems. What's new and exciting and what most of my clients want to talk about these days is fiber optics. And there's, there's a significant reason for that that we're going to talk about in this, in this webinar. So what is fiber optics? Um, I think it's very interesting. It's not a new technology. It's just being used in, in a new sense. Um, fiber optic lines are, are strands of glass. And so each strand of glass acts as a conduit and relays digital code from one side to the other at the speed of sound. It's a much different system than something with coax that has physical limitations in comparison to fiber optics. Now, what, what are the benefits? What, why, do, why does everyone want fiber optics? Well, besides the fact that data is transmitted at the speed of light, you're, you're transmitting data up to 20 times faster than your traditional coax-based systems. And why is that important? It's, it's because as we go on and there's advances in technology, um, you have more and more needs for bandwidth. And that is only going to be satisfied and delivered through a fiber system. 
Um, today, you have over 16 devices connected to your internet, from your thermostat to your to your computers, to your televisions, to to iPads, and so on, and go and and so on and so forth. And that's only going to increase over time. So, with a system that is is able to deliver significant data um, in a very efficient manner, um, that that's why these systems have become so so desirable. Uh, another another feature of fiber optics that I think is really something that catches people's attention is the fact that it provides symmetrical bandwidth and that means you have the download speed and the upload speed in the same in the same way um, same speed what you'll see with the hybrid systems is you may think you're getting 400 download but when you don't pay attention to what the upload speed is that might be 20 or 30 so it's a, it's a really big difference um, also with fiber optics you're gonna have the ability to increase substantially over time so while you may have one gig service now which is very very robust service you could increase that up to 10 times um, simply without having to do a new installation of a telecom system so you're really future proofing your community for the future An Another um, benefit of fiber optics especially that I think is just not talked about enough is improved reliability. I can't tell you how many times I have associations that have a legacy network and they're telling me that you know when they're, when they're trying to stream video they get the little buffering screen and outages and so on and so forth and you know while the providers are out there and required to maintain it um, there's really nothing that you could do um, to, to solve it as far as a brand new, shiny, um, state-of-the-art system. And so it, it's, it's, it's no surprise that the weather here in Florida just really degrades this. And, and I have to tell you, um, dur during COVID, when I was working from home, like many of you, um, you know, I had some issues as well. And, and when they came out to check out my equipment, they opened up the pedestal and all my equipment was corroded. Now they fixed it and it's, it's gotten better, but there's nothing like a new fiber optic system to be able to address all of that. And 99% of the time, it, it resolves those reliability issues. Now, another thing that these, these agreements bring to your community is, is improved services. For example, you might be able to have dark fiber laid between your gates and your management system, or your management office, to be able to support internal uh, intranet, so internal emails. Also, a community channel is a, a great thing that these agreements bring. So a lot of these providers are now doing it in app-based. And so uh, people like Leslie could really appreciate that it's, it's this um, app or community channel that allows her to, to communicate with, with her residents uh, and board members in a very efficient manner. Um, an another thing, besides the, the savings that you have individually, um, a lot of associations pay for services on a retail basis. For example, in the gym, you might have a bunch of TVs, um, other common areas. Now, it is very common um, for us to include these courtesy accounts that are typically paid for in retail um, in these agreements. And so what you're doing is not only saving on the individual level, you're taking services um, that you were typically paying for on a retail basis and now getting them for free. So there's a, there's a double benefit there. I really can't stress that enough. Another thing, um, I commonly like to include Wi-Fi in common areas. So if you're out by the pool, um, maybe making that a, a work day by the pool and enjoying this beautiful Florida weather, uh, you could have some, some really good bandwidth to support your needs in that regard. Uh, this, besides the savings itself, it's also the ability to lock in pricing. So any one times you have one, any, anytime you implement one of these agreements, you're going to have a provision that talks about the applicable annual increases. And that, and that's, that's really important because I think a lot of us have experienced promotional rates from different providers. Um, there's, you know, direct TV is pretty famous for this, you know, getting you in the door, giving you a certain price, uh, two years later, you're getting a 20% increase. So what you're doing is you're locking in the price for the term of the agreement. Now, I say that, but you really have to read the small print, and that's why you need the assistance of someone like ourselves to help you in this, because there's, it is very common for these providers to promise you a certain annual increase, and then you'll see a couple pages down buried in that 70-page document the ability to increase outside of that annual increase. Well, if you have the representation of this firm assisting you in that, um, that, that those backdoor ways of increasing will go away. And it's, it's very important to be able to do that for budgeting purposes, 
um, and, and really control unintended increases or arbitrary increases so you don't have to redo your budget or specially assess your residents. This is one that 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 commonly um, you know causes a lot of frustration. So I think we've all had a situation where we've had a problem with our television or internet or whatever, and you may call a customer service number that might be based outside the U.S. and they're reading from a script, and it can be very very frustrating. Well, I can say that there are a lot of providers out there that have U.S.-based call centers. Um, and, and it is very common to have a dedicated number just for bulk. So what does that mean? When you have a problem, you, you call up the 1-800 number, whatever that may be, you speak to someone, and immediately that phone number registers up on their screen as to what your bulk um, agreement for your community provides. So they're, they're well in tune, and you're not in the general population of people just calling in for random problems. Um, they, they should be up to speed and, and able to assist you with your specific association and, and the needs that, that you have for customer service. So that's something that is a, is a major benefit that you get with uh, specific providers out there. All right, um, going to take a break for a moment and pass it back to uh, Mr. Kassauer. We're going to talk about statutory analysis. And, you know, as, as we talked about in segment one and two, what is a telecom agreement? Um, what are the benefits of it? One of the things that is, is critically important is to really understand the applicable Florida law here. And, and there is both uh, applicable laws and statutes in uh, Chapter 718 for condos and 720 for HOAs. And with that said, I'm going to pass it over to Mr. Kassauer. All right. Thank you, Michael. So I know maybe one or two of you are here because you were hoping to hear about how you could get a bunch of money from telecom providers, get better service for cheaper, and, and, and well, you know, fly through the 21st century with the latest and greatest technology. But obviously, we know most of you are here because you want to hear about statutory analysis for compliance <laughs> with 718 and 720. That's what gets people pumped. And I, yes, I am absolutely sarcasm. Sorry, what was that, Ash? Uh, uh, absolutely. Let's... That's what I'm here for. Right? Yeah, no, got to give the people what they want. It's, it's all about technical legal analysis. People love it when I drown them in this sort of information, um, my family included. <laughs> so anyway, with that, that tongue-in-cheek uh, opening here, um, there, there's a handful of ground rules you should know about bulk telecom because there are some special provisions of the Condos and HOA Act that apply. Um, 718, hopefully all of you know this, this is sort of an advanced class, so I imagine you guys know which law applies to you, but whenever you see a statute with 718 up front, that's for condominiums, 720, that's for the HOAs out there. So let's start off with 718-115. Um, first of all, bulk telecom uh, expenses are common expenses. Um, the second bullet on this screen is actually, it, it truncates the statute too much and we have to build it out a little bit better for the next presentation. Um, but what it says in the Condo Act in full under 718.115 is that the costs under a bulk rate contract may be allocated on a per unit basis. So instead of the percentages in the deck, on a per unit basis, rather than a percentage basis, if the declaration provides for other than equal sharing of common expenses. So basically what it's saying is that if your documents are silent on bulk telecom and how you allocate the expenses, that might lead one initially to believe that, hey, that means we should chop it up like based on the percentages in the deck like anything else when we replace the roof or whatever it might be. It's actually not the case. And the Condo Act confronted this issue head on. And now it says expressly in there that, um, that you can allocate it on a per unit basis if the declaration provides for something other than equal sharing of common expenses. Um, so everybody basically pays per door is the general rule in the industry. You don't pay based on a little bit more if you have a three bedroom instead of a two bedroom, it's per door. It can be something that is otherwise if your documents mandate it though. So that's something that you can consider if you wanted to, but basically as a practical matter, most of our clients say it should be per door because that's typically how people pay for bulk telecom. Um, you can get, if there is a bulk telecom agreement for those that are hearing or sight impaired, um, you, if you, and you do not occupy a unit with somebody that is not similarly limited based upon disability, basically means that you're disabled and you're not able to enjoy these features, you can be excluded from the bulk telecom agreement. So there is that sensitivity for those un people who are unfortunate uh, enough to be suffering from those impairments, and we want to be sensitive to that. HOAs, um, even if your documents similarly do not provide or address bulk telecom services, the board typically still has discretion just like they do for 
for any other type of not-for-profit setting. Um, generally, there's broad contractual powers for the board of directors, and it's no different for bulk telecom. The board may contract for those bulk telecom services, and the cost shall be an operating expense and must be allocated on a per-parcel basis. So the HOAs like the condos, they both double back to that per-door uh, uh, basis. Um, so every, every owner is going to pay the same rate as a general rule unless you're in a, a little bit of a funky situation. Well, I have Leslie. a question for you there. So yeah. what about the homes that maybe they own two lots and they have a house um, on one lot and then they have land on the other? Mm -hmm. um, and so that counts in the contract as a door because they could be built on at some point but maybe they're not using the services. Do they get billed for that? How does, is there any um, case law on something like that? So Mike, Michael, I know recently had to deal with this for one of our Palm Beach County clients. So Michael, would you like to, to answer that one? Yeah, sure. I, I, I mean, so you're still, you're still going to divide the expenses based on the number of lots. So despite the fact that a structure might be on one, um, if, you know, if they have a double lot, they're going to be paying twice. So Typically, uh, and as Michael has referred to, we just had a client that we, we had this issue. These were five and 10 acre lots. What we did is we negotiated um, the ability to have those services provided to the other lot should, should it be developed in the future. But the simple answer is yes, you're going to be paying twice whether or not you take full advantage of it. Um, I know in some equestrian um, communities, they may have a structure on one, but they maybe have other improvements that were to support uh, the equestrian um, use of the property. So typically you're still going to have infrastructure brought to both and maybe only one is being utilized, but, but definitely you're going to pay per lot unless the governing documents provide otherwise. Um, but it is a pretty common, common thing to, to negotiate into these agreements and making sure there's flexibility to adapt to, excuse me, uh, future developments on the other lot that might not be used currently. Great, thank you. All right, continuing on our journey here. Um, this is building out a little bit more. Seven eighteen one one five. There, there are more subsect. Uh, more, more. There is more to that provision. But again, to drive it home, if the declaration does not provide for the services as a common expense, just like the HOAs, I said this was at the end of the last slide. The board still has the power to enter into the contract, and the cost will be a common expense. So again, bottom line is, if you're saying as an association, Michael and Michael and Leslie. This sounds like a really great idea, but I'm not sure our association is able to do it. We've never had bulk telecom in the past, and I don't see anything in our documents that contemplate it. Can we do it? Generally speaking, the answer will be yes. Your documents as a condo or an HOA do not need to mandate bulk telecom or even talk about it. It can become a, a common expense, albeit a special category, one that is typically allocated on a per unit or per parcel basis rather than on, as a common expense based on the percentages in the deck. No amendment to the governing docs is needed, um, but you do always want to carefully review these documents, uh, the governing docs at inception, because especially for older uh, associations that did, for whatever reason, contemplate bulk telecom, a lot of the times it might say that it's for video service only. And so that would make may foreclose out the possibility of internet. Um, some newer associations talk about internet, not cable. Um, so, because obviously a lot of people are cutting the cord these days and go into the, you know, the Netflix and the Hulu and all that fun stuff. Um, and that's honestly why we do a lot of bulk internet uh, agreements as well from time to time these days. It's, it's got its own demand. Um, and, and as Michael, I think, discussed and could, could talk about even more, that there are opportunities as he, and I think he'll talk about it in the next section of the presentation, you can even do some sort of hybrid structures for th those services. But start off by looking at the docs and make sure there's nothing squirrely that forecloses out cable, internet, or both. If there was a prohibition, then there's a prohibition, and you need to be sensitive to that. But rarely will you see an outright prohibition. It's more about, do we have some sort of limitation on the on the, the category of bulk telecom services? That's what we typically are looking at for here. Right, and adding to uh, what Michael was talking about in 718 is that simply the legislator in Florida expanded the definition of what a telecommunication services um, encompass. And so it's it really encompasses any of those services that I mentioned earlier and I think got uh, the first part of the presentation. So I know my association, um, you have documents a little over 30 years old, only spe specified video, but because of the expanded definition of telecom services in 718 and 720, 
um, you don't need to amend the docs to be able to move forward and have the authority to implement a bulk internet while your documents or maybe limited to video. All right. And then I'm, I'm sorry to say this, this is the last stop on statute or our statutory compliance journey. So you're going to have to get back to the boring stuff about how you can have laser, uh, laser fast internet speeds at a fraction of the price and get boatloads of money for your community for those that are interested in that sort of thing. Um, no, so to, ter to terminate the agreements, I do too much sarcasm and my family tells me nobody gets my jokes, so I apologize. <laughs> um, for the, the last stop up on our statutory journey, let's talk about terminating these contracts. Um, hopefully, you won't ever need to deal with this. We deal a whole lot more as a firm with building up these types of um, these relationships rather than tearing them down. They usually are very fruitful for our clients. Um, there are situations where sometimes there can be onerous contracts, especially developer contracts, maybe that are not the best in the business these days, um, where you do want to get out. Um, we also sometimes use these provisions as a leverage point um, if we want to maybe try to do an early negoti renegotiation of a bulk telecom agreement, um, because we can, uh, because a lot of the times the struggle is these are long-term agreements, um, and there are not usually easy. There, there's not, they're not, there's no termination for convenience. Um, these providers typically invest substantial amounts of money um, into building out these infrastructures. So to you know have them spend hundreds of thousands or potentially millions of dollars building out an infrastructure um, to then terminate is obviously something that they don't typically build into their contracts. Um, now these statutory provisions you see on the screen, um, you know how that would play out if uh, if ultimately you terminate with the telecom provider after they've invested these these monies in building out your infrastructure. They may seek some sort of remuneration. So I, I um, this is this is sort of a an always developing area of the law. There's been very little appellate guidance on it. So to say how things would be interpreted um, if a bulk telecom provider said, "Wait a second, I just spent a half million dollars building out my infrastructure, and now you're telling me the members voted to terminate based on some condo HOA stuff," you might be biting something off um, more than you may want to chew. It could be a battle, but it's also a leverage point sometimes. But, without but it does ado, say here, but it does say here by a majority that they that the members could vote at the next regular meeting or, or special meeting of the association. So if they sign the contract in February and the annual meeting is in April, if they don't do it at April, they miss the boat. Is that what that means? That exactly yeah, right, yes. Leslie. That's what that means. But the thing for condos, especially and HOAs too for that matter, is when do you really convene a membership meeting? We all know we do the annual meeting every year. In condos, people typically vote by the balloting method. There's no, you may circulate proxies on a voluntary basis, but it's not necessary like in an HOA. So I'll tell you, I have condo clients that have had successful elections year in, year out, 20% return of the ballots because there's no proxy requirement, but they haven't had a quorum of the members present in a, you know, since uh, since uh, Bush Bush uh, 41 was president, um, you know, it, it's something that could go back decades since they've had a membership meeting. So when is the next regular special meeting of the members? Um, you know, that's a, that's a really good question if you just never get a quorum. Um, so you could be further downstream on your bulk telecom uh, relationship than you realize. But you're exactly right, Leslie, that, you know, logically, you would hope it would happen within the year before things have been built out too much. But we've seen this play out in different ways for, for that reason. I understand. Okay. And, and because of the significant threat of terminating one of these agreements and potentially causing adverse consequences to your association, this is why Michael and I and Leslie always – advise our clients and boards to involve the members have town hall meetings don't don't just decide as a board to go ahead and implement one of these agreements without hearing from your constituents and so that this threat right here is the reason why you involve your members and uh, so so yes you can terminate a regular con a bulk telecom contract at the next regular special meeting of the association interpreted to be a membership meeting um, and and so if you do not um, take advantage of that the next time a quorum of the owners are present as an association at a membership meeting, then, then the, the contract will effectively be ratified. Um, now, that's that's for what I will call a normal uh, bulk telecom contract right, as contrasted with a developer bulk telecom contract. 718.302 paragraph 1 is another provision of the Condo Act that is not specific to bulk telecom. Uh, but, but it's a provision that deals with developer contracts where when the developer is control of the association, um, which can be for up to seven years for a condo, um, if the association enters into a contract, then owners other than the developer 
um, not less than 75% of those non-developer voting interests can cancel the contract, bulk telecom or other types as well. So that's another uh, interesting one to note if you're a younger community. And when I say younger, it could be 15 years old. Because remember, a condo takes seven years sometimes for turnover to occur. And then you could have a 10-year bulk telecom agreement, 17 years right there. Um, you know, so, so you might have the ability to terminate developer-controlled contracts for a lot longer than you would otherwise think as opposed to a non-developer bulk telecom contract where you probably did have a quorum present at some point recently and have effectively ratified. Um, moving on, 72309, now we're in Oops. HOA land instead of condo land. Um, any contract entered into before July 1 of 2011 where the costs are not divided equally amongst the parcel owners, so if you're doing some sort of percentage instead of per door, may be changed by a majority of the voting interests um, uh, at present at a meeting so that costs are allocated per door equally. In addition, any contract entered into by the board may be canceled by a majority of the voting interest present at the next regular or special meeting. So like that concept I mentioned under 718.115.1D for the condos, HOAs, you have something similar. The next regular special meeting of the association, also typically interpreted to mean the members, not a board meeting, you can do the same thing. So next time you get a quorum present, after that bulk telecom contract, that's going to be your chance to potentially invoke this termination provision. But again, anytime you're going to threaten these things or explore them, like Michael said, you want to educate the members on what's going on. You want to consult with legal counsel. That way you're being mindful of all the risks because this can be a pretty hostile act if you ever try to do it. Again, these providers have likely spent tens, hundreds of thousands, maybe even more than that. So that's the statutory compliance section. Uh, I'm now going to hand it over back to Michael for the home stretch on how to implement a bulk telecom agreement for community associations. This is hopefully when it all really will tie together for you folks. Um, and then uh, we, if we have a little bit of time at the end, happy to try to do a bit of Q&A. Um, and you can also reach out to us directly. But Michael, take it away. All right. Uh, thank you. Bef and before I really get into the, the meat and potatoes of how to implement one of these agreements, I just want to mention something that commonly is asked uh, of us um, is, is when do you, when do you start paying attention to implementing one of these agreements. You may have an association, you may currently have an agreement right now that is coming for expiration in the next couple of years. So w when do you want to focus? Um, it typically takes about a year to, to build out one of these systems. So in a perfect world, you're going to start thinking about it about two years in advance. It gives you time to negotiate and, and get proposals from different providers um, and then adequate time to build it out. So I just want to mention that because I don't think we have a slide and it, it's a common question we, we, we com commonly receive. <clears throat> So the most important thing is to hire competent counsel and have good professionals. So these are long-term agreements, um, and it's really important that you hire the best person that is as the most experienced with the best um, relationships to assist in these matters. Um, you know, the way I approach this with, with Michael is somewhat unique compared to the way other attorneys uh, handle this. So I think it's a bifurcated process because as much as the agreement you're presented first draft talks about the services you're going to be provided and, you know, the cost of the services and all the other terms that you would expect in one of these agreements, the first part of your relationship is a construction project. So, you know, we, we really pay careful attention to that first aspect of it because any construction project is going to have bumps in the road and you want to have you know adequate protections in place and adequate mechanisms to deal with any issues that may arise so that's something that that we really um, I think is a unique approach um, and we commonly have very significant provisions and exhibits that we add to the bulk agreements for any of the main providers down here um, you know besides hiring competent counsel just like many things in life, it's all about who you know. So over the last, I'm going on 20 years of negotiating these agreements, uh, we've implemented with all of the main providers down here. And, you know, it's just a matter of who you know. So if I have a question or I have an issue or I want better terms, I'm not dealing with your typical account rep. I'm dealing with upper level management. And that really bodes well for our clients. It's, it's we're, we're able to bring terms and negotiate things that you typically would not provide or not be able to um, if you didn't have the significant experience level that we bring to the table. So Michael, let me ask a question, you know, not to um, knock um, the, um, in the industry consultants that provide service in negotiating these, re these relationships as well. 
um, you know, they they have long term relationships and lots of experience as well. Can you walk us through a little bit of why going straight to an attorney would be the better option um, than if we went through a consulting firm? Why why a telecom attorney? What's what's the how does that help the association? Absolutely. Uh, it's also a common question. And we actually have a slide coming up next. But since you teed it up, I love talking about <laughs> it. Is it something that it's really not talked about uh, nearly enough? So, you know, the services that even though I'm an attorney, I provide the same level of services that you would from your consultant. In other words, the first half of the relationship, not only am I exploring what services are desired, as you see up on the screen, you know, figuring out what's the right fit for your community. Um, you know, then, and then the second half of that is, is obviously a negotiation of the agreement. So the big difference between an attorney and a consultant is the fact that you're getting disinterested advice. So what do I mean by that? You know, we're compensated on an hourly basis. Um, so it really does, my sole goal and Michael's goal is to make sure our clients have the best provider, the best services, you know, at the best pricing. And it doesn't matter if you go to Bluestream, you go to Hotwire, or you go to BreezeLine. We're just ha we're just here to put you in the best position to make that choice. When you have a consultant out there, and they're good consultants, and I've worked with most of them out there, um, they're compensated based on a success fee. And sometimes, which is was is, is happened in, in recent years, is they're compensated directly by the provider. So what you have is you have a professional who's getting who is not able to provide disinterested advice. In contrast, they actually have a financial stake in that transaction because they're getting paid a percentage of typically the door fee or what other benefits they bring to the table. So they, you might be getting a recommendation to go to one provider versus the other, not because it's the best fit, but it's because it pays that consultant more than the other one. And so what you're getting is disinterested advice. And you're and you're getting someone who's governed by the Florida Bar ethical rules, and so uh, you know we take those 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 obligations very seriously. Um, but there's really no way other way to describe the inability to provide dis disinterested in advice when you're getting compensated based on that kind of structure. And as I mentioned, some of these consultants are getting paid directly by the provider. So what what is concerning to me is that all of these models are based on an ROI so return on investment so if you're a hot wire or a blue stream and you want to figure out how much you're charging for services you have to, it's a formula of the investment versus the revenue and the pie is only so big so if you're slicing out a piece of that pie for the provider to pay you have to question and wonder what rates or what what benefits is the client missing out on and so that's something that you avoid with someone like us. You get transparency, transparency, and you get disinterested and independent advice. Impossible to do so when you're not charging on an hourly basis. And one more thing, wouldn't we still need to have the contract reviewed by you prior to execution since they're not attorneys in working with the contract? Absolutely. And, and, and I work with some of these consultants who whatever reason they were retained instead of us and you know they they, they are not a one-stop shop so they're able to get the proposals negotiate the provisions but you still need someone with the experience level that we have to negotiate and implement significant revisions to these very complicated agreements so we are a one-stop shop and i think a lot of our clients appreciate that um you kind of only have one cook in the kitchen and it makes it a lot easier to to move forward all right. So as thank you, Leslie, for teeing that up. It's a very significant topic um, as far as, you know, how to implement, you know, as I was mentioning is we have to figure out what kind of services you your association needs, whether it be video, Internet, you may want to include bulk telephone um, or even home security. How many TVs and, you know, kind of figure out how many bedrooms they have, um, whether or not premium services are needed. And then you really have to understand who your who your members are and what kind of level of bandwidth they may need. You may have a community that has a lot of people working from home, much bigger needs from bandwidth than 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 another community that 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 may have a um, an older population. It just depends. That's the first aspect of implementing one of those those agreements. Now, after figuring out what the needs are of an association, um, with someone like myself, I'll, I'll go and solicit bids from these providers, making sure that um, each one of them are providing the terms that we're looking for. And, and, and besides the fact that you have a statutory obligation to get competitive bids, you're not, 
competition yields the best results. And so having bids from multiple providers gives you the comfort level to know, yeah, this is above market and, and this is, you know, a little bit more attractive based on rates. So having that is really important. Um, and as Leslie mentioned, uh, the last part of this slide is you really need to consider how your professionals are getting paid. Are, do you have someone who's independent, who's getting paid hourly, and is just there to make sure you are happy and get the best result of that negotiation? Or do you have someone who's getting paid based on a success factor, on how much money they save, or you know, because one provider is paying them more than the other? So when you look at one of those agreements from one of these consultants, you really have to look at the terms of, of how they get paid, why they get paid, and whether or not that's the right fit for you. So here's one more question for you, Michael. I have done this a couple of times here in South Florida, and I'll tell you in Texas, I never had this issue come up, but in South Florida, it does. There's oftentimes a board member who thinks that they are the most qualified to negotiate this contract. Maybe they have some telecom experience from the past. Um, maybe they have a law license. Um, how, what, what do you think about that? Listen, I, I come to work every day and I learn something new. And one of the things I always do is keep my ears open. And, you know, as a, while I'm an attorney, I'm not an electrical engineer. I'm a, uh, you know, I'm not a, you know, telecom scientist or whatever it may be. So there might be board members that are really useful in that regard. But I really think that this is one of those opportunities that you really need to have the best person handle the, that that matter. And as Michael was mentioning at the beginning of this webinar, you know, we're a full service firm. So we have a mantra that anything that comes in the door, you want the best person handling it. What you know, you don't want someone dabbling. And so if there's a board member that has experience, I would suggest that I work with them. Um, but I think it would be a mistake to to rely on maybe that. they're the maybe they're the committee chair but not the voice of the negotiation right right somebody Close. who's the funnel the board contact on this Absol particular item you, you, you always need a liaison and i think that's really important especially someone who could speak the technical lingo to you know to, to the to the layman um and so i invite having those participants but i also caution people from dabbling I think it's really important to have someone um, who's very experienced dealing with this. And so what's great about these, um, these, these engagements, um, one of the benefits I think we need to add to the next slide is oftentimes we also negotiate a reimbursement of attorney's fees. So that fee doesn't come to us. So when I negotiate with a provider, not only we get a door fee, we get better rates, but I also suggest you'll need to write a check to my client we, you know, Florida Bar frowns upon getting paid by third parties that reimburse my, my client. And so it's very um, unique in, in the sense that you get cheaper services, better services, and you have someone pay the bill. So you really can't beat that. It's a, you know, a triple play if, if you want to call it. I love it that. that. That's awesome. All right. So mm -hmm. the next part, how to implement a telecom contract. This is my, my really my favorite part. It's the negotiation, okay? So these are these are very complicated agreements. They're up to 70 pages, and when I'm done, usually make it 80 pages. But, you know, I can't really stress the need to hire someone because you have a one shot at this every five to 10 years. And the difference between, let's say, a consultant um, also versus someone like Michael and myself is that, you know, these consultants come by every five to 10 years when it's time for a new contract. But, but that we have a different goal. Our goal is to be your everyday attorney. And so I want to make sure, and Michael wants to make sure that, that we, we implement one of these contracts that is, is good for many years, meets the needs of your association. Um, but also it's very common that once you get to see what we're able to bring to the table, um, they start asking us to do other things and we welcome that opportunity and really would appreciate um, any opportunity to speak to any of the board members or, or, or property managers out there that, that want to discuss one of these uh, contracts and, and how to assist in that regard. And I'm going to pass it over to Michael and Leslie for our, our conclusion. Thank you, Michael. And thank you, Leslie, too. Um, that, I, that was a, a great presentation, as always, Michael. I thank you for being out there and Leslie for, for putting this together and, and co-presenting with us. Um, th this topic, I think, really is exceptional. Like Michael said, there is a, really an opportunity for, he called it the triple play, for just such an economic like windfall for your association 
better services, cheaper price, maybe a door fee to help you deal with some imminent maintenance costs where you can be getting checks for hundreds of thousands of dollars, especially in a larger community as a door fee, forgetting about the, the cheaper and better service and the infrastructure builds outs. And then your attorney's fees oftentimes get reimbursed 100% at the end. So it, it can really be as close to a darn no brainer as you'll ever see with any type of business relationship in the industry. Um, we're always here for you if you have any questions or concerns. Uh, within reason, it's never too early to reach out. Um, as Michael, I believe, uh, suggested in his conversation, this is not something you want to do several months before your current telecom agreement provi uh, expires. You want to be talking to us about this two to three years in advance in a perfect world. Um, something that really gives us enough time to leverage your bargaining power, negotiate the best deals, educate your members, host workshops, solicit input, all the stuff you want to do so that when you actually do put pen to paper to sign, you're, you're set up for success and your constituents believe in you. Um, and it really is, it's, you know, we like to sit in the background and let management and, and, and the board take a victory lap, but this is one where as a board, you really can take a tremendous victory lap with your community. They, the outcomes of these transactions are just so fabulous and people feel it. They interact with it every day. When your internet speed improves, people appreciate that. When your cable gets better, if you're a TV junkie, you 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 appreciate that tremendously. And I'm referring to myself as the as a guy that watches too much TV and plays on the internet too much. Um, so it's incredible. It helps improve property values. Even sometimes internet speeds are a huge thing for the stay-at-home workforce. This is a big deal. So try to capitalize on the opportunity. I really encourage you to do so. Um, now, if you want to contact our firm to help with this, uh, please feel free to do so anytime. The left side of your screen shows. Frank Weinberg and Black, Michael Kammer, Michael Kassauer, myself. Um, feel free to reach out anytime. You see a direct phone number there for Mr. Kammer, um, and you also see the firm's phone number in the bottom left. That's the 474-8000 number. Um, on, on the right-hand side of the screen, you see Community Ace, uh, Leslie Alvarez. Uh, truly can't say enough good things about Leslie. Um, she is an exceptional talent in the industry. She's involved in the community, uh, you know, with the, the organizations uh, for the industry, and she's just one of the hardest workers I've ever known. And I'm not speaking about management in particular. I've, I've, I've just been blown away by how much she cares about doing a good job. Um, so with that, Leslie, uh, I, 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 hopefully I'm not making you blush too much, but if you'd like to say anything to close things out, uh, feel free to take us home. No, I mean, I thank you so much for allowing me to be your guests here today. I really enjoyed getting to see both of your faces. It's been a little while. Um, but, you know, in general, guys, you know, this is a, um, a, like you said, a great opportunity for many associations and, um, you know, they need to make sure that they're taking care of it, um, you know, proactively and, um, you know, as aggressively as they can. And that's one of the things that I like to do is I like to really manage in a proactive manner and look towards the future and not just look um, at what my, you know, um, immediate um, emergency is. So anyone that is interested in any um, private um, consulting, I consult with self-managed associations or is looking for new management services, um, I'd be happy to speak to them. Welcome to um, reach out to me on my email or um, on my office line, and I'll be happy to see how I can help their community. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you both. Thank you. Thank you, thank thank you for you. everyone that attended today. I really appreciate everyone's time. Thank you, everyone. Have a, have a great rest of the day. If you have any questions or concerns, please contact us anytime.